let me uh, start right away. Um, so this is the, so you already got the title, the structure of trade type and governance type organized crime groups and network study, kind of a clumsy title. This is the, the summary of the talk. Uh, I want to briefly um, speak of the motivations for the paper and for the work, and then uh, uh, the hypothesis that we want to test, uh, the data that we use, the methods that we use, and then the, the results, and then we conclude. So the structure is uh, uh, pretty straightforward, I would say. Uh, you will recognize it. Now, the motivation for the paper, it, th those of you who know me, uh, they know that, you know that I've been uh, very dissatisfied for a number of years with the concept of organized crime. I don't find it um, the way it's usually defined, both in the literature, but also, of course, by, uh, by in, in criminal justice work, as well as in criminal codes, not a viable concept for um, analytical research or analytical purposes. Now, usually I, I have a slide at this stage in which I put up the, the definition of organized crime that you normally find, which is something like two or three people get together for some period of time and commit a serious crime. You know, that's the definition of organized crime. And uh, I'm not the only one to be finding this definition not satisfying. And I usually put up a second slide where I have um, very distinguished scholars who have preceded me, such as Smith uh, and then Mike Levy, Klaus van Lamp, and many others who uh, speak to the inadequacy of this concept. Uh, now, of course, there, is, there are two ways to do this. One is just to give up on the concept, and the other one is to kind of refine and unpack it, which is what I try to do. Now, something that um, I haven't done so far in this kind of presentation is to briefly mention another type of, um, of way to think about organized crime, which is through the efficiency and security trade-off uh, put forward mainly by Carlo Marcelli and some of his co-authors, in which they rethink organized crime and mainly criminal networks in terms of the trade-off between efficiency and security. But uh, again, I don't have a lot of time to, to discuss this perspective, but again, I find it uh, wanting uh, because it, again, it doesn't really distinguish the activities that groups do. It again, uses criminal networks as a single entity. And then uh, some of them uh, stress efficiency, some security, but it's not very clear why they would do so depending on what they do. Uh, this is also an opportunity to mention Carlo Morselli, of course, who. Uh, has unfortunately left us and has been a very good colleague, a friend of mine. And so I want to pay tribute to his work as well. Um, so let me just tell you what I think uh, we should do with uh, the concept of organized crime. For me, the structure of the organized crime group depends on what it does, depends on its aims and its line of business, which is another way uh, to put it differently also, <laughs> Uh, is that um, uh, what, the other, what the organized crime do affect its structure, of course, controlling for the level of law enforcement. So the way I see it is that activities produce a particular structure. Depending on what you do, you would be uh, having a different uh, internal structure. So that's my approach to that problem. Um, now with uh, colleagues such as uh, Paolo Campana and Anya Shortrand, we have, um, try to unpack then the, the concept of organized crime and try to see what actually groups do in order then, which is the additional work we're doing today, in order to then derive their structure. And again, some of you have seen this before, uh, what we do in this framework is simply to take uh, well-established, well-known concepts from economic sociology or broadly speaking economics, uh, production, trade and governance, and uh, identified the fact that some people, some groups uh, specialize in, say, production, let's say, cocaine or heroin or counterfeit goods. And once these goods are produced, uh, there are other groups that are involved in uh, moving the, group, the books, the, moving the, the goods from one place to another and distributing them somewhere else. And that's a very different activity from the production of, of the goods. And then, uh, there is a third type of activity and a, and a third type of group that you find in the illegal world that do not engage in production of the good or in moving the goods, but want to 
set themselves up as the guys who give permission to others to produce and to trade. And this is what we call governance type organized crime groups. And they are in effect what I've been working on for most of my life, which is uh, academic life, which is uh, mafia type organizations. But within this group also we have insurgencies and ultimately at the very end of this continuum, you also find ultimately the state when you move into the legal world. So this is the framework that I find useful and I want to continue to work on. Um, the framework generates additional questions, of course, of a transition from production to trade. Can a group who is involved in production then transit to become a trade group or a governance group? These are additional questions that I'm looking forward to explore in the, in the future. Now, um, a framework, of course, is not a theory. So a framework uh, should help us generate some theoretical predictions. And what I want to do today with this paper, uh, what we want to do today in this paper is to uh, see the structure, in a sense, the dependent variable through the lenses of, uh, of social network analysis. And uh, for reason of space and also time, uh, both here and in, in our life, we are going to focus only on trade groups, a group that specialize in distribution of trade of goods and groups that specialize in governance. Um, now, um, let me now start with the, sort of the substance here. And how do we think about trades group or groups that specialize in trade and, and distribution? Now, this is a very much work in progress, I should say. So I welcome comments and this is a sort of thinking that is not yet fully formed, but um, we are trying to give a first uh, stab at it. So we think of these groups as being transactional, typically uh, commodity changing hands in a chain of exchanges where each actor only possesses the commodity for a brief period of time. Payment are one time payout from involvement in the particular exchange. Points also made by Carlo in his own work. Uh, Letizia Pauli has define these groups as temporary coalitions formed to achieve a specific goal, and then they disperse once the goal has been reached. They are similar to supply chains populated by criminal entrepreneurs, uh, worked by Qin and Zhang. So these are not groups that want to be monopolist. You know, they act uh, in competition with other groups. Uh, there is a low barrier to enter and uh, the life time of this group is usually short or shorter than the governance one. Um, now, what are the sort of network features of this group? Um, and what do we expect to, to find when we do network analysis of this particular type of groups? So as we do in the paper, we have three hypotheses that we expect to find. Uh, the first one is that we expect these groups to be dense, uh, somewhat clustered, centralized, and uh, for the purpose of effective and short-term coordination. We expect um, the path between nodes um, to increase the, the three short, so short path between nodes, which uh, allows information to flow more efficiently. And also we expect a low level of homophily. In a sense, these are people who need to, to talk with people who are different than themselves often. And so we expect a tendency for nodes uh, with different characteristics to form ties with one another. So just to be clear, by homophily, we mean, uh, and I try to do my sort of design here, two nodes who have the same attributes. So in this case, could be both males and they have a tie with each other. So the opposite of homophily, which is probably heterophily, means that you might be a male and you're in touch with a female. Uh, so that's what we mean by, by homophily. So these are what we are trying to think about the features of trade type organized crime groups. Now, on a more traditional territory for me, uh, there are governance type organized groups. So what we would normally think about as in terms of mafias. Um, so as you know, starting from the work of Schelling, or you can go back even further, these are groups that aspire to govern, to rule over portion of the, of the underworld. They have high start cost, high startup cost, they usually have a long time horizon. They obviously, violence is a crucial ingredient to, to this group. They need to defend the territory. They need to defend against the invasion. And so they have to invest in violence in a significant way. And of course, not just in violence, but also in information gathering in their territory. 
And we expect tomophily selection based on demographic characteristics. So we expect people to be quite similar to each other in terms of ethnicity, gender, also social group membership. So homophily, we expect it to be high. Now, uh, in terms of social network hypothesis, so how do we actually operationalize this in SNA um, hypothesis? We expect these networks to be more decentralized uh, with low level of clustering, that the path length between nodes to be longish, which reduces, there may be they're less effective or efficient, and a high level of homophily based on, uh, on demographic attitude, uh, attributes. Um, so the longer the path length, the less is the visibility of the network uh, the, uh, node uh, within the network. So that's the hypothesis. I mean, obviously I have to go very fast because I don't want to hold up you for more than half an hour. Um, this paper is a secondary data analysis so we have used the existing data sets, which has got its advantages and disadvantages. Um, obviously we cannot uh, collect, in this case, we didn't collect our own data. The first data set, which we take it to be a trade type uh, network is a heroin distribution network of criminal entrepreneurs in New York City, uh, prosecuted between 91 and 93. This was collected by Natarian in 2006. Natarian is a professor in the US, as you know, who works on drugs. Uh, nodes, nodes represent actors and ties or edges represent uh, calls, phone calls between actors. There are 38 core members who had two or more contacts and were involved in five or more conversation with 87 ties. And the attributes described with the nodes gender and role were reconstructed from Natarian's work. And there are four roles in this network. There are the sellers, the retailer, the broker, and, and the secretary. Now the data set number two is what we call in the paper a hybrid between trade and governance. It's a network of entrepreneurs and mafiosi uh, working together to rig uh, public contracts in Italy, in Messina. And this is, again, it's a data that collected by Cavallaro. Uh, it was based on a judicial document, this pre-trial documents that you find in the Italian judiciary system, which tend to be very rich. So Cavallaro has done work similar to the work I did with, uh, with Paolo Campana in the past, and they coded this document and um, ties represent physical meetings between these people. There are 101 people in the, in the network and the ties are 256. Um, now the nodes were classified. So also here we have got the attributes the next to the ties. And so some of these people were affiliated to the Mistretta mafia family others to a, the Batanese mafia family, uh, then others to other families unspecified, some were unaffiliated entrepreneurs, were not member of any mafia, and they were bosses and foot soldiers. Uh, and we reconstructed uh, some of this also from another paper which used the same data set. Um, great, now the third data set, the third data set, it's uh, a IRA um, group, uh, the Provisional Irish Republican Army, members between 1977 and 19, uh, 1980. Uh, Gio and others is the, the paper where they have analyzed this data set. Now, you can see that we have decided to include uh, a group which is not technically a mafia, but it's a governance uh, entity. So we think we are going up this, the, the continuum on governance type. So the nodes are members of the provisional IRA, uh, where the least five connections to capture the core of the network, Ties represent at least one of the following relationships, involvement with the IRA activity, friends before joining, or blood relatives, or related through marriage. Now, we only included active members as nodes. Uh, there are 260 people and 340 ties. There are attributes in the data set, such as gender, age at recruitment, marital, marital status, university attendance, affiliation with the IRA brigades, involvement in violent activity. There are several roles in the data set, like senior, gunman, IED constructor, improvised explosive device constructor and planter, and several tasks, involvement in foreign operations, involvement in criminal networks, such as bank robbery. Uh, there are some missing data that we imputed, uh, especially age of recruitment, and we, inputed, we imputed them 
using the mean recruitment age for the node marital status. So that was what we did. Uh, now, um, let me tell you something about the coding decisions, uh, validity and reliability, and the methods that we used to analyze the data sets. Uh, now, we, in order to increase uh, comparability between these data sets, which are diverse and different, of course, we just coded um, edges as one and zero. So this is one and zero in our undirected ties. So if you, are, if you have a tie, you also have a reciprocal tie. Um, then we have, uh, yeah, well then as it always happens in this kind of, uh, of work, we have uh, um, issues of validity and reliability such as missing data and the boundary specification problems. Now, in order to address these issues, we turn to some of the best papers in the field in that uh, discuss missing data and, uh, and boundary specification, namely Campana and Campana and Varese. So we have discussions of this in the paper. Uh, we can come back to this in the discussion if you want. Uh, um, but let me say that um, both issues are important in network analysis. Where does the network end, for instance, is a major problem in network analysis. It's been a classical problem in network analysis. So let's pause this for a moment and we can discuss it in, uh, in the, um, the Q&A, but it's discussed uh, extensively in the paper. Um, now, the, the other limitation of the paper is that, of course, depending on the network, the ties are different. So in some cases are face-to-face -face encounters, some cases are phone calls. And also we don't have gender in the Cosa Nostra network. Um, so these are the main limitations that we see in the, in the data. Now we use two kinds of methods to, to analyze the data. Some descriptive measures, which are often very useful to get a sense of the of the, of the network. Uh, but of course, the scripted measures does not, do not tell us whether we will find this in any other network. So in order to test hypotheses on the data, we use uh, statistical models that help us explain how network times are, ties are formed. And these are the so-called uh, ERGAM um, methods or ERGAM models, they're called exponential random graph models, which allow us to, to model tie formation and whether there is more likelihood of a given node to have a tie with another node depending either on network properties such as reciprocity or on attributes such as gender, I mean, like sex, you know, male and female or uh, gender. Um, so this is the message. Um, this is quite um, a sort of cutting edge. In fact, I've got here the, the biggest book on exponential random graph model, which it's the Bible for those who do this kind of modeling. Um, now, let me uh, come to the results. I think I've still have got 10 minutes. Um, these are how the networks look like, the heroin distribution network, the Cosa Nostra network, and the IRA network. Uh, just by looking at the network, you can see they are different. Um, obviously, how different, uh, it's a matter of quantitative analysis, but you can see that the heroin distribution network seems to be made of ties of people who are much more in touch with each other than the other two. And on table, in table one, we have the basic uh, network statistics or descriptive statistics, the number of nodes, the number of ties, the average degree, and the maximum degree, and the maximum shortest path. So you can see, for instance, the shortest path is much shorter in the heroin distribution network than in the IRA network. So it's much easier to reach people within that particular network as opposed to, um, to, the, to the IRA network. Um, and again, degrees you can see that um, are different. Now let me uh, move on to the first results. Uh, so as I said, we are going to do some descriptive statistics, kind of network statistics results, and then the testing of hypotheses. Now the first results ref refers to the concept and the mess and the method and the and the measure of Centralization. Now, uh, centralizations, as I try to put it up here, captures how equally degree is distributed among nodes in a network. So degree is the ties that a given node has got with other nodes. And so the more, uh, so C1 is uh, one node as the maximum degree possible, while all other nodes have only one edge, meaning the network is maximally centralized. So I try to give a picture here which is out of this very famous paper by a guy called Baran, who is credited with inventing the internet, uh, which was, as you know, was done for military, military purposes. 
in the 50s. So Baran wrote a paper, and this is one of the famous pictures that he had in that paper. So that's a very, very high level of centralization. Now, C0, all nodes have the same degree. So the network is fully decentralized. Now, if you look at these uh, results, uh, the heroin network is much more centralized than the Cosa Nostra network and the IRA network, which is what we expect to be the case. So people are much more in touch with the key player in the heroin network than in the Cosa Nostra and in the IRA. Uh, the next, um, the next uh, measure we use in the paper is the clustering coefficient. Um, so a node clustering coefficient, CP, is the extent to which a node neighbors are also connected. So the neighbors of a node are those nodes with which the, 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 the edge, I mean, the, the, the node shares a tie. Um, so those nodes with which it shares a tie. So if the CP is one, all of, all of nodes pi's neighbors are also neighbors. If it's zero, none of the nodes pi's neighbors also share a tie. I thought that in order to make it more clear, I did a, again, I took a picture out uh, um, that might help you. So if you have high clustering coefficient, so you look at the top right um, corner, hand corner in this two by two table, you see the guy in the middle with the green dot has got, of, it's got um, a, lot of a lot of ties with other people, so high level of degree, but also the guys he's in touch with have ties with each other. So that's a high level of clustering coefficient. Uh, in the, at the lower left bottom of the table, you see the guy has got very, uh, it's got neighbors who don't have ties with each other. I hope it's clear anyway. Uh, we can come back to this, it's not very clear. This is some, comes also from the work of Watts and Strogatz, which has been used to study the small world problem. Anyway, clustering coefficient, mainly meaning how are the people I'm in touch with in touch with each other and I've got ties with each other. Um, the result is this one. So this is the clustering coefficient, the local clustering coefficient distribution for the three networks. Now, again, what you can see here, uh, I hope you can see it, is that somewhat uh, bimodal distribution for Cosa Nostra and the IRA. So you tend to see in Cosa Nostra and the IRA either a lot of, net, a lot of, of nodes which have either zero or one uh, results and very little in the middle. Well, if you see, if you look at the, um, at the heroin network, you see much more of an even distribution and even on 0 0.4, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, clustering going on, a lot of, of um, nodes with high level of clustering. So although differently, we think that uh, the, the two net, the three networks are behaving as we expected um, and uh, Cosa Nostra and IRA networks are, although, there is a different degrees in which they have coefficient, clustering coefficient. They are behaving in a similar way, very different from the heroin network. Uh, I think this is the last measure, uh, which is the geodesic distance distribution. So the geodesic is the shortest path between two nodes. Um, it's uh, used to understand how easy or difficult it is to reach a node within uh, uh, usually how, you know, flow of information, for instance, how easy it's for information to flow within the network. So typically a longer geodesic between two nodes will increase the difficulty with which information flows. And this guy, Friedkin, who has been also used by Krebs, uh, makes the point that the geodesic distance of two represents a horizon of observability. So basically, if it's very, very, if you're very, very far, you don't kind of observe the, the node. A geodesic distance of two represents a horizon of observability. Nodes for which the shortest path between them was two edges or fewer at visibility of each other attributes and action. I mean, it's a bit metaphorical, but I hope you get the point. Uh, the shortest the, the geodesic, the easier it is to see the other guys in the network. Now, again, what is the result here? And the result here, again, we see the three networks behaving differently with uh, Cosa Nostra and the IRA behaving in the same sort of direction, but the, the IRA network being even more extreme in that, uh, in, in that way. So you see here in the heroin network, a lot of twos and threes. And uh, while the Cosa Nostra does have a lot of threes and fours, but also five and six and seven, 
and while the IRA network goes up to 16. So um, a much harder distance, I mean, it's much harder to reach the network in, uh, in the governance type, and especially in the IRA network. As, and you remember the, the Cosa Nostra network is somewhat of a hybrid between a pure governance and a, a entrepreneurial network. Um, uh, I think I might have to, to, to ask for a, a five minutes additional time. We do have another measure I forgot, which is the assortativity coefficient. Now this tries to uh, capture in a descriptive way, homophily within, within the network. So the assortativity coefficient for a given node attributes, attribute provides a means to investigate homophily tie in a network and it's interpreted like a Pearson correlation. So a value close to one suggests uh, assortative mix mixing. Nodes of the same attribute value tend to form time with one another. So one means that there is a lot of um, forming ties um, with uh, people of the same type. And minus suggests this sort of missing. So nodes of different attributes tend to form a tie. Oh, it makes sense. So one means that you form ties with people like you, and minus one that you form ties with people who are different from you. So we should expect a lot of minuses in the heroin and a lot of pluses in the other two guys because we expect homophily. Uh, and that's what we find. I mean, we find that there is um, low as or negative assortativity coefficient in the heroin. And uh, we find negative for the Cosa Nostra as far as role, as you can see, but then it's all positive from there onward, except for university attendance in the IRA and in Cosa Nostra. Again, the two networks are behaving as we expected. Now I come to the end of the talk, which is the final test we do, which is now a hypothesis testing. And we do this through uh, exponential random graph models. Now, this is um, the purpose of these models is to, as this paper said, describe the local selection forces that shape the global structure of a network. Um, so it's really a way to investigate how ties are formed. So you, you have one network and uh, through using Markov chain simulations and maximum likelihood estimation, you simulate many networks and you see how likely it is to find the tie and how different it is from random. Um, so let me say what I wrote here. Uh, generative models that simulate networks using Markov chain, Monte Carlo, maximum likelihood estimation to evaluate parameters, so it allows us to do hypothesis testing. Basically, you can, what the beauty about this is that you can test uh, attributes and network, and network properties on data which are not independent of each other. So as you know, network data are by definition not independent of each other as you would need in a regression model. And so statisticians have come up with this way of testing hypothesis on network uh, data and the data are in themselves not um, independent of each other, which is a crucial assumption of, of regression. So in a sense, we just take it. I mean, we just believe these guys and use it. And the, the beauty is that these models can be interpreted as logistic regression models. So in a sense, something we know, um, where node attributes, uh, ties attributes, network structure are the independent variables and the likelihood that the ties form is the dependent. Uh, we can have multiple independent variables, so we can test hypotheses, controlling for each other. Um, what else? Um, we can interpret as log odds. Uh, but what is very important to know about these particular models is that we cannot really compare across models. So the magnitude of the coefficient are not comparable across models uh, based on different networks. So this is one of the limitations. So you can really just see the direction of the plus or minuses you can see the size, but you cannot really compare and say that in one model, the effect is bigger than in the other. So that was my ergam in, in, in three seconds. Uh, now, um, it, they're quite difficult to present. So I present you this one and then I do a narrative summary of the other two. This is the ergam for the heroin distribution network. Uh, you can see the first line is just the, the intercept. You would call it the intercept in the standard model, so you don't interpret it. And then there are two kinds of things that you see here, N, F, and N, M. So node factor is the likelihood that the node will form a tie with any other node. 
more um, than would the, with the baseline, which is seller. So the not factor, for, for, say for broker, is the likelihood that broker will form a tie with any other node, not necessarily a broker, more than they would uh, from a seller. Now, this is really not very interesting for us, and we use it as a sort of a, as a sort of a baseline uh, or a control variable, because what we're really interested in is the node match, which is the likelihood that a given node will form a tie with a node of the same type. So in the case of NM seller, we are trying to find whether this seller is forming ties with somebody who is not, uh, who is also a seller, who is also a seller, and it's negative. We don't include NM for, seller, for others, brokers, retailers, secretary, because they didn't have any ties. So it was minus infinity. That would make sense. Um, so what we find here is that you find that the sellers do not um, speak to other sellers, which again is what we expected. And we also find that there is a degree of decentralization in the network. Um, so there's a decentralization mechanism and there is a tendency of trials to be closed. I'm sure it's not very clear, but I'm uh, happy to, to have Niels explain it better. Um, now, let me show you the narrative for the other two uh, models and then I conclude. Um, now, the narrative for the other two models is, uh, is the following. Um, I see a lot of uh, messages in the chat. I hope I'm not missing out on something. Uh, no worries, Federico, it's all good. Okay, good. So let me um, give you the narrative for the other two models. Uh, so in the case of the Cosa Nostra model, uh, we have, uh, and these are, uh, N, uh, so these are people who have uh, ties with uh, people different from themselves or each other. So these are, uh, results for the, um, sorry. Um, so I'm discussing really not much now uh, in a narrative way, not much. So bosses are more likely to form ties and foot soldiers. Members of the Batanese family and the unnamed other family are significantly less likely to form ties than unaffiliated nodes. So basically these guys, um, do not form ties easily. They tend to form ties only with people of the same mafia group. So mafia family members are more likely to form ties with members of the same clan, which is what we expected. And there is a positive and significant closure. Um, so if you have a tie with somebody else and, and, and two other people, these two other people who don't necessarily have a tie with each other tend to have a tie. So there is a closure of the trial. I hope I explained it um, well enough. Uh, the ergam for the IRA is very similar. Again, we are discussing only node um, match terms. So the ties for marital status and for recruitment age are both significant and their signs suggest homophily based on these attributes. Uh, the brigade membership is also positive and significant. So they tend to have ties with each other. Uh, unaffiliated nodes are non-significant, but violence participation, participation in violent foreign groups, they all have ties with each other involvement in foreign operations, all significant and positive as expected. And there is a degree of decentralization here and also of trial closure. So the, the network is not centralizing, but the trials tend to close. So there are small clusters of connections within a bigger network. Contrary to what you find in the heroin network where everybody is, is, is in touch with each other. Now, uh, let me conclude. I think I only went over by roughly five minutes. We think that our hypotheses are, are supported by the data, um, T1 to T3 and G1 to G3. We find that governance organized crime group form sparse decentralized networks. There is a degree of homophily and long path, net, long path lens between actors. While trade organized crime groups show denser, more centralized network structures where ties are less determined by homophily and more dependent on creating network configurations that allow for quick coordination and rapid spread of information. So I think the general point here is that um, by adopting that framework that I discussed at the beginning, production, trade, and, and, uh, and governance, we can now move forward beyond the framework and try to test whether the activity does generate an organizational structure 
which is obviously informal and is best captured by network analysis, that is different depending on what you do. And I think this is a first attempt to test that idea. And we do find that depending on what you do, you have a different uh, internal structure. So I think we have now combined activities and structure to show that there is a difference of structures depending on activity. And I think this will put the study of organized crime firm on a firm foot. Uh, thank you very much.